May the 9th of 2018. We're here in Oklahoma on this beautiful springtime day. So grateful to have some warm weather for a change instead of it being so cold. And I love that I get to do this with my favorite people in the whole wide world. <laughs> so grateful that Spencer and Kim help us. Spencer's actually doing these recordings for me, so um, my hat's off to him, and I'm just in awe that he would do this for the service of the Lord to record these videos. So thank you, Spencer. Sure appreciate it. Yesterday, uh, we were reading in Samuel, and I kind of got carried away a little bit about Eli and his sons and some of those stories, but also in yesterday's reading, because the Israelites are <clears throat> still at war with the Philistines, they're getting their tails whooped. Um, yesterday in the reading the Philistines actually captured the Ark of God and that's a huge thing so May 9th 2018 1st Samuel 5 we're reading uh, chapters 5 and 7 5 through 7 um, first first out first first sentence that we read is after the Philistines captured the Ark of God they took it from the battleground they carried the Ark of God into the temple of Dagon and placed it beside an idol of Dagon. I, I just love this. So it's what the Ark of, of God represented. It wasn't the physical presence of God, but it represented God. It represented who God was. They really knew that it wasn't God himself, but it was the Ark of God. It's, it's, what they carried the Ten Commandments in it was um, it was holy and it was it represented righteousness and so here they take it and they put it they place it beside an idol called Dagon or Dagon or however you say it Dagon as far as I know uh, and then what happens is <laughs> when they went in to see it the next morning Dagon has fallen with his face to the ground in front of it so <laughs> Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. And, and here we're seeing it because here's this physical idol that they just place the Ark of the Covenant next to and it falls on its face in front of it. Um, so they took Dagon and they put him um, in his place again. But the next morning, the same thing had happened, but this time his head and his hands had broken off and were laying in the doorway. Now, here are these Philistines who refuse to acknowledge the only one and true God. There is only one God. They refuse to acknowledge him. They are worshiping who they call God, which is in the form of some kind of little doll or something, Dagon. And his head and his hands get broken off and it falls in the doorway. And from then on, they refuse to step in the doorway. They step over it. <laughs> That's, they recognize it as holy enough that they step over it, but they won't recognize God as God and then acknowledge what the Ark of the Covenant meant and who the one true God is. So anyway, it continues on and they get these tumors. They're plagued with tumors. And so they just keep moving the Ark of God from one village to another village and nobody wants it because none of these people uh, believe in, in, in God Almighty and they get plagues every time that they... Uh, uh, place it somewhere else so this is going on all the while that um, the Philistines are kicking the tail of the Israelites so now Samuel is the prophet because uh, or is the prophet and he's also the priest because the sons of um, Eli have been killed and then Eli was killed in the in yesterday's reading so <clears throat> I'll just start in verse 7. When the Philistine rulers heard that Israel had gathered at Mizpah, they mobilized their army in advance. The Israelites were badly frightened when they learned that the Philistines were approaching. <coughs> <coughs> Don't stop pleading with the Lord our God to save us from the Philistines, they begged Samuel. So Samuel took a young lamb and he offered it as a burnt offering and he pleaded to the Lord to help Israel. And the Lord answered him. I've got to take a drink. <coughs> Just as Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines arrived to attack Israel. But the Lord spoke. I love that. That's why it's so important that we pray and that we listen. Because he's speaking to us. 
And, and all through this, uh, from, from reading clear back from the beginning, when does change take place? When God speaks. The Lord spoke. But the thing is, he's speaking all the time. Change is available to us. Your life isn't going the way you want it to go. Change is made available to you with the words that God's speaking to you, but you got to listen. So we pray and we ask God. Samuel prayed and the Lord spoke, but then he listened. He had to hear him. <clears throat> but the Lord spoke with a mighty voice of thunder from heaven that day. And the Philistines were thrown into such confusions, confusion that the Israelites defeated them. So in this column of reading, the Philistines defeated the Israelites. In this column of reading, the Philistines um, killed the Israelites. They did it again in this column, but in this column, Samuel prayed, God spoke, and the sound of his voice confused the enemies to where the Israelites were able to defeat them. See, I, I want you to get revelation of how God works. That's why we read, what, who is our God? What does he mean to us? What's his heart? When they listened, when he spoke, all it, all it took was he just confused the enemy. I mean, and we think that God can't take care of that boss that's overwhelming us and is being a pain in our rear, or the bullies at school that, you know, is picking on us, or the teacher that's, you know, not being fair and just. We, we think that our problems are too big for God. This was a whole army, uh, an entire army, and all he did was confuse them to the point that the Israelites were able to um, uh, defeat them. <laughs> That's just, there's, there's so much power. But I think probably the number one verse in today's reading happens to be 1 Samuel 7, 12. Up to this point, the Lord has helped us. That's that proclamation of faith that every single time they pray, God helps them. Every single time they turn to him, God, and every single time you turn to God, he will help you. He is faithful he is not the one that changes. We're the one that changes. Our mindset changes. Our thoughts change when we start turning to him and saying, God, I can't do this on my own. I, I can't, I'm not capable. I don't even know what the next step is. God, God is the one that changes us from the inside out. We're moving into John chapter 6, verses 1 through 21. <clears throat> This is one of the most well-known um, miracles that has taken place in the Bible. There's actually two of them <clears throat> where uh, Jesus feeds the thousands with just some bread and some fish. But this happens to be the one where he, where he fed the 5,000. So <clears throat> the crowds just kept following him because Jesus just kept doing miracle after miracle after miracle. There's, there's a place in the Bible that says that one of the uh, disciples that wrote... The gospel said that if they really put into on onto paper into words all of the miracles that Jesus did, um, that there wouldn't be enough paper available, or uh, the, it would fill up m mountains. Or that's my words because I can't remember the exact quote of the scripture. But the point is, is that it's impossible to put onto paper all of the miracles that Jesus did while he was here on this earth. So they they just kept coming to him and flocking to him. And so, <clears throat> at this particular time, what I want to point out, though, is Jesus didn't just sit back and wave a wand, and there appeared the bread and the fish. Jesus worked through his disciples and through the people who was following him, the people who had faith in him. And, and in this particular place, place uh, it was a young boy. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. I mean, how would it feel to be that young boy, knowing that he's the only one with food and he gave up what food he had for the sake of Jesus and then they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets of scraps left over. What would it feel like to be that boy? But then what would it feel like to be Philip who said, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? And, and, and it says that Jesus was testing Philip for already knew, he already knew what he was going to do. But see, when Jesus said, what do we have? It's kind of like, what do you have in your hand? Well, the boy actually had uh, five barley loaves and two fish. That's what he had in his hand. And look what Jesus did with what was in his hand. 
And then he gave it to the disciples and now they have it in their hand. What do you have in your hand? That Jesus wants to do a work and he'll do a miracle through you if you just acknowledge what it is he's already given you. Where you're at right now today. And so he told everybody, first of all, to sit down. So that took action on their part. <clears throat> so they all sat down. Then Jesus took the loaves, he gave thanks, and then he distributed them to the people. Afterwards, he did the same with the fish. So the disciples had to take the bread that Jesus blessed and distribute it. The disciples had to take the fish and distribute it. You know, so many times we want to sit back and we want to do nothing, and we just think God's just going to do, do it all. And he does, he does the hard part. He changes us from the inside out that makes us then know what to do, which is our part. We have a part in this, but we get it backwards. It's all about, oh, I, if I just do enough, then he will. No, 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 no. See, the miracle took place first, and then they had to act it out. They had to, they had to do their part, but the miracle took place when he, when he blessed it. From the moment Jesus blessed that bread and that fish, there was enough to feed 5,000 men and all of their women and all of their children. But if they hadn't taken the, the bread and the fish that was blessed, they all would have starved. Hmm. The miracle had already taken place. Provision's already been made for whatever it is you're called to do. Most of us are praying for the provision so we can answer the call. No, 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 we answer the call and we walk into the provision. Mm. Then <clears throat> that evening, Jesus' disciples went down to the shore to wait for him. But as darkness fell and Jesus still hadn't come back, they got into the boat and headed across the lake towards Capernaum. Soon a gale wind swept down on them and the sea grew very, very rough. They had rowed three or four miles when suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water toward the boat. They were terrified, but he called out to them, Don't be afraid, I am here. Then they were eager to let him in the boat, and immediately they arrived at their destination. They get to see Jesus walking on water. And he's walking on water in the midst of their fear. Mm. Mm, it's in their greatest fear that they see him walking on water. Hmm. I think there's a little bit more to that we could explore. Proverbs 14, 32 and 33. The wicked are crushed by disaster, but the godly have a refuge when they die. Wisdom is enshrined in an understanding heart. Wisdom is not found among fools. Thank you for joining me today.